so there was just a few moments of like the like a uh i don't even know like what to kind of compare it to i'm sorry there's a horn honking outside and it's super annoying and how we got to see Eddie's evolution. Sorry, there's a car horn. And her grow and change and adapt. And I will tell you all my thoughts, or at least some of my thoughts. Now I'll tell you, meh, this is what I'm gonna do. Hi everybody, it's Audrey and welcome back to Chapter and Converse. Today's video is going to be all the books that I read in March. And I'll be honest, March was kind of like a fuzzy month. Like I definitely feel like I was preoccupied and distracted and had a hard time focusing in a lot of ways. And even when I was trying to pull this pile to do the video, I was like, what did I even read this month? And I was going back and I was like, I read The Push. No, I read that in February and sure enough, I read it first book I read in March feels like a hundred years ago. So I'm a little bit fuzzy still. I had a good reading month in that I enjoyed a lot of the books I read. I didn't DNF anything. I didn't have a hard time getting into a book once I started reading a book, but I had a hard time kind of starting a book and sitting down with it. So I did read a bunch of books. I have a lot of exciting things to say. Yeah, that's probably not the right word to say. I think it's safe to say the fuzziness is still with me. So bear with me as we talk about all the books that I read in the month of March. So the first book I read was The Push by Ashley Audrain. And I definitely enjoyed this book and I definitely wanted to know what was going to happen next. And I was fully invested in Blythe. But even though I would say like, I, I probably would land it at a four star, I it didn't blow me out of the water like so many people are like oh my god like it's the best and it's so mind-blowing i liked it i enjoyed it i enjoyed the writing it's definitely dark and messed up so it's hitting my sweet spot but i didn't think it was like the blow up oh my god oh my god oh my god book of the year for me so far so I do think it's a book where you want to go in knowing as little as possible. So what I am going to say about it is not in any way, I think, things you wouldn't want to know or things that I wouldn't have wanted to know going into it. So this is interesting in that it's actually like a multi-generational story. So in present day, we have Blythe Connor, who is our main character, but we also get insight into her mother and her mother's upbringing and then her grandmother's upbringing and very much how their lives and kind of the views on motherhood and their experiences has influenced Blythe but also how you see the different experiences of all three women and I didn't know that going in and I think it's fine that I didn't know it going in but I didn't I wasn't as invested in the chapters about her mom and her grandmother so I really was interested in Blythe's story and I think that's what took me out of the book and not that they were bad or uninteresting or anything like that, but I wanted to know about Blythe and her story and that's where my interest lied. What we know about Blythe is she is happily married and she has some concerns about motherhood. She has some experiences from her childhood, which we do get some insight on. And she winds up having a daughter, Violet, and from the get-go she has never connected with her daughter at all and she just feels like something's kind of off and is it her and is it her sort of hesitations about motherhood like what is going on but basically like her husband doesn't see it nobody else sees it and it becomes that thing of like is it in her head or is there actually something going on here and why doesn't anyone understand what she's saying about sort of her disconnect that she's having with her child because then she has a second child named Sam and from the get go, she and Sam are like completely connected. So it's definitely an exploration about motherhood. It's an exploration about family. There is, I think some really well done passages and descriptions and just all the emotions that Blythe is feeling all over the board. And that's where it gets very raw and at times very dark. And I really enjoyed that part of it. 
So I think she did an incredible job with Blythe's character. I do think it's worth the read. I will also say I am not a mom. So I think coming into this as a mom, you might also have different insights, different feelings for better or for worse. Obviously your experiences are completely different than mine. So I do think reading this as a mother could be a definitely different experience than the one I had, but I enjoyed it. I would still recommend it. And I do love darkness and messed up -edness. <laughs> big time. <laughs> so I enjoyed that of it, but I thought it was just, you know, more power to Ashley Galdrain. I really enjoyed her writing. So that was book number one. So no surprise, I read a lot of thrillers this month because it's where I go when I need my fix. And I read Every Last Fear by Alex Finley. So you guys, if you follow me, have already heard me talk about this book because I talked about it before it came out. I talked about it when I bought it and here I am talking about it again. <laughs> but I just was so excited for this book. So I got this at Murder by the Book. I think I've talked about this literally like five or six times, you guys. I know, I'm sorry, this is it, this is the last time. I told you I was gonna buy it in my shopping video and I did and I showed you, but I'll show you again. It came with a little book, um, book plate that he signed and this was first novel and I really enjoyed the ride on this book. So this is definitely page turny. I needed to know what was going to happen next. And it has one of the best first lines ever, which is they found the bodies on a Tuesday. And I was actually watching an interview with Alex Finley yesterday. And he was saying how like that was the first thing that came to him. And he was like, that's it. Like that's the opening line. And then he was like, well, now what do I do? Like, what do I do next? How do I talk about this family? How do I explain what happened to them? How do I, how do I, how do I? And I was like, I love listening to a writer talk. So this is a story about the Pine family and Matt Pine is a student at NYU and he comes home one morning after kind of like a raging night out and the police are there and they are there to tell him that his parents and his younger brother and sister who were in Mexico on spring break have died in a tragic accident of a gas leak in the home that they were staying in down there. And not only kind of does this make front page news because it's such a tragic accident, but the Pine family has kind of some low key fame to them because Matt's older brother, Danny, was convicted of murdering his girlfriend, I think five years earlier, and a Netflix documentary has been made about the family, which has thrust them completely into the spotlight about did Danny do it? Is it a wrongful conviction? And Matt's father's quest to prove his son's innocence and get him out of jail. So we wind up seeing multiple points of view multiple timelines so we get to meet the family before they make that fateful trip to mexico so we get to know them there's an fbi agent on the case so we get her point of view we get matt's point of view there's so much happening in this and i don't say that in a bad way so i found that having all these different perspectives and getting to know all the characters and weaving all these timelines together to really propel me forward with the story. And I just wanted to know because you know on page one that the family has died, but then you get to know the family over the course of the book. And I felt sadder and sadder as the book went on because you're actually getting to know these characters. And I think from a writing construction of a book standpoint, it's amazingly well done. And again, if you're a writer, I will link this video that I listened to with him. This is different than the Jennifer Hillier one I talked about. I'll link it down below if you guys are interested. But I always find it so fascinating to hear about how a book was written and where the ideas come from. But I very much enjoyed this. It like made me sad at times. And then there were times where it felt like so real. And I think because I love true crime and Netflix documentaries about it and podcasts about it, and he said, you know, it's not based on any one specific crime that has happened, but even the interviewer, and this was my thought too, reminds me of the Adnan Syed Heyman Lee murder that happened in Baltimore back in 1999. And there's just so many twists and turns and characters in this that I very much enjoyed it. All in, I would say an enjoyable ride, definitely page journey. This one also landed at a four star for me. There were a couple moments in this because you are, he is writing the mother, the father, 
the FBI agent, the younger daughter who is a senior in high school, both of the boys, the younger daughter's chapters. There were moments in that where I definitely felt like, okay, there's like an adult man writing this perspective right now. Because not that it was out of touch in a way, but there were a few things where I was just sort of like, as someone who was a high school girl who went to high school parties. <laughs> like, let's well, not totally how it went down. So I definitely feel like there was like a she's all that moment. So if anybody has seen that movie, you might know it, the reference when you get to it here. So it's not critical um, to the mystery in any kind of a way. All in. I very much enjoyed it and more power to him. I'm so excited. He's getting so much love and praise for this book too. So I feel like, a lot of these books, I'm like so excited for the authors too this month. So after talking about this book for Ad Nauseam How Many Videos, I am so excited to have it. I'm so excited I read it. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And yeah, thumbs up for me, for sure. The next book I read is The Mixed Up Files of Mrs. Basil E. Frankweiler by E.L. Conningsberg. And I actually already lent this to my mom, which is why I don't have it. But I read this book as a kid and I loved it. So I read this for middle grade March. I wanted to read something sort of nostalgic. And I was talking to my parents about it after I read it. And I was like, I don't remember if I read this book and like that's why I became obsessed with Metropolitan Museum or if we were at the Metropolitan and I wound up, they probably sold the book there or I knew about it afterwards. But this is just such a great, delightful story about a brother and sister, Claudia and Jamie. And Claudia, they live in Greenwich, Connecticut and she wants to run away. And she wants to kind of, experience life and have stories and have secrets and have adventures and she convinces her brother to go with her and they take the train into new york and they decide to hide at the metropolitan and they live there for a week and have this great adventure and this great mystery and it's just it's it's adorable and it's sweet and it's fun and i just loved everything about it so this was written in 1967 it's a whole different New York, obviously, but it's so fun to read about. They reference lots of real places. They Obviously the museum is, <laughs> it's real. There's floor plans of the museum that are in it. The rooms that they sleep in, the things that they see there are all parts of the museum. And you know, they're at the library annex, they're at Grand Central, they're on Madison Avenue. And I just loved it so much. So as an adult, I think there's a lot that you can take away from this. I think it's a great book for kids as well. And fun fact, for me at least, the edition I have is a 30th, 5th anniversary edition. So there's an afterword by the author and she talks about getting published and she talks about kind of her journey. But she also included her original letter from when the editor of the book who wound up buying the book wrote her and said like, I'm in, like, let's do this. And uh, E.L. Conningsberg actually lived like five minutes away from my grandparents, which is just crazy to me. Like I love these like little connections that you find. And I told my mom, it's my mom's parents. And I was like, this is where she lived. And like, this is where they grew up. And I just thought it was so fun to have like another little connection. So I get excited for that kind of goofy stuff, but such a fun book. So glad I revisited it. And when my mom is done, it will be back on my shelf um, for good. So the next book I wanted to talk about is actually one of my five star predictions and I will go into more detail in that video which is going to go up mid month but I read Pet Cemetery by Stephen King you guys my first Stephen King book and I'm not mad about it I'm not mad about it um this cover is <laughs> I can't even I feel like is it better if I do it this way sometimes dead is better I feel like this is less terrifying for everybody to have to look at so not mad that I read this book at all. I wound up doing some of it on audiobook and Sarah had actually recommended the audiobook because Michael C. Hall narrates it and he is just tremendous. Sorry, I'm gonna show you the scary cat. And the audiobook is definitely really good, but what I found, and I do have kind of this relationship with audiobooks, I really wanted to experience the writing and I found because I tend to listen to audiobooks when I'm going for a walk or something that I was missing out on stuff in the sense of like sometimes I would hear something and I'd be like all I want to do is like dog ear the page and I'm not home so I can't do it or I do tend to get a little do 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 sometimes look at the birds look at the bunnies look at the clouds that I felt like I was missing a few things so I did wind up going back and rereading 
some of what I listen to on audio. But if you are better at audiobooks than I am, go for it because it's tremendous. It's very, very well done. So there's a tremendous forward in this book by Stephen King where he talks about how this book was actually inspired by something that happened to his family in real life when he was working as a writer in residence. And his daughter's cat was killed by a truck passing by and his son was almost killed kind of running out towards that same roadway but Stephen King caught him in time and he kind of worked through that fear that he had with this book and kind of put it in a drawer and kind of many years later he needed a book to give to one of his publishers because he had a contract to fulfill and didn't have a book at the time and gave them this one and it's really interesting to see how that true story completely is in this book reading the forward from him but it's definitely it's dark and messed up it's gross at certain times it's creepy at times it is gut-wrenching and full of grief and full of pain and full of fear and it is it is so much more than i thought it was going to be in so many different ways it definitely made me cringe and freaked me the heck out at certain times so i do think it was a great introduction to him it was a great introduction i'm kind of like low-key intro to horror there were definitely some like uh -huh moments which i was expecting and if you guys have followed me you also know that part of the reason why i have not picked up a stephen king book is because i was definitely emotionally scarred from watching the movie pet cemetery the original one in my friend's basement in high school and if you follow me on instagram you know that i actually took the plunge and i rewatched the movie after i read the book and i am pleased to say that I have exercised my pet cemetery demons because the movie definitely was not as scary as I remember it being. And I think part of that is due to the fact that like the effects, because I think the movie came out in like 1990 or something like that, or 91, 89, something like that. Definitely not as scary as I remember it. The effects are not as impressive as they were when I was younger, but when the cat dies, still totally gross. <laughs> when they pull him off the ground, oh my God. And then there is a scene towards the end that is rough. But what I will also say, and then I will stop talking about Pet Cemetery, is I watched the trailer for the new Pet Cemetery that came out maybe like two years ago or something, because that was also on Amazon Prime. That looks terrifying. I am not ready for that. I am 100% not ready for that. Let me know if you guys have watched it. That looks like incredibly well done but terrifying as all get out and i'm just not ready for it yet so no no thank you no thank you to switch gears for a second i did a reread and i read annie lamont's bird by bird and i actually wound up doing the audiobook of this and read along for parts of it this is nonfiction. this is for writers out there and if you're a writer you're probably like yes i know you don't have to tell me and this is just such a great book so it's instructions on writing in life and it's just full of so many great nuggets and she is she's such a boss she really is this book is i've read this book multiple times you guys so it's like dog-eared which you can probably see i know i'm always like messing up the focus on this i have highlighted it in multiple colors because i've read it multiple times purple was this one's this time you just can't go wrong if you're a writer you cannot go wrong by reading this book. It's such great, beautiful inspiration. It's such honest, brutal truth. She just talks about her experience. It's everything from dialogue and characters, shitty first drafts, how to get started, an introduction about her background. There's a lot about her family, how her father influenced her. She talks a lot about her son getting published, writer's block, just all of it. So it's just such a tremendous book. I, I can't recommend it enough. It's not a craft book in like, it's going to tell you, it's not like a save the cat, like here's how to plot, here's how to ramp up tension. Like it's not that kind of a book, but it's, it's inspirational. There's definitely huge nuggets. It's more, I find like it got me excited again about writing. If you need to kind of pick yourself up off the floor, it's great for that too, but it's just a really honest, beautifully well done book. And I really enjoy doing the audio. I'm looking, it first came out in 1994, so she's great. She's just absolutely great. 
So the next thriller I am so excited to talk about is The Sanatorium by Sarah Pierce. And if you guys follow me, you know I've already like talked and talked and talked about this one because I'm so excited. And it was also part of that like books I want to buy, book depository. I love the painted edges. So I actually wound up tabbing this because I did not want to fold over the pages, which is so not like me. But you're going to see with the next book too, I did the same thing. But this is an isolated thriller in the Swiss Alps and I loved it. It's a debut book. I know it's been everywhere. And I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this book for so many different reasons. And this is about a woman named Ellen and she is a former detective from the UK. She's kind of on a break. She kind of has some stuff, a little bit of baggage, a little suitcase of baggage following her behind. And she goes up to the Swiss Alps with her boyfriend because her brother Isaac, who she has a bit of a fractured relationship with is getting married and it's a little bit of an engagement celebration and Ellen actually knows his fiance fiance I said that funny fiance from when they were younger but hasn't been in touch with her in a while and hasn't seen her in a while so Ellen's nervous on a couple different fronts because her and Isaac have a little bit of a weird relationship and she hasn't seen his fiance in a bit and just again her suitcase full of baggage is, is following behind but they go and it's this beautiful, beautiful hotel that happens to be built on a sanatorium, which used to treat people <laughs> a long time ago. Um, but it still has a lot of the very creepy sanatorium-ish vibes. And it pays sort of an homage to the history of the place, but begs the question of like, why? So things start out perfectly fine, if not awkward, but then Isaac's fiance goes missing and that's when things really start to turn. And then of course we get weather. So we do get an avalanche. So the police are not able to get up to the sanatorium slash chalet hotel to be able to help out. So even though a lot of the guests have been able to get out before the avalanche comes because it was predicted, there's still a whole bunch of them that are trapped and Ellen, sort of against her own will in many ways, winds up investigating what happened to Isaac's fiance and tries to help find her. So she is, like I said, a former detective, but this is not in any way a police procedural. Like this is a woman whose friend has gone missing and whose brother is pleading to her to help. And she, not only, I mean, she has no jurisdiction because they're in the Swiss Alps and she's from the UK, but she's also kind of not really a cop right now. And she's not really feeling great about doing this, but she does it. And what I loved about Ellen, lots of things, but one of the things I loved about Ellen is it's not, it's not a procedural. She's not a perfect detective, but she's also not a stereotypical detective who's like recovering from like a bad divorce or is an alcoholic or has that like unreliable stitch going on with her, but she's very real and she's very human and she does have her own stuff and she's not perfect. And you know, she does a lot of stuff right and then she makes a lot of bad decisions and she's just so, she's just so profoundly human in not just her investigation, but in her interactions with her brother and in her interactions with her boyfriend and sort of with the stress of the situation that's going on. So I very much enjoyed having what I would dare I say a reliable or a relatable main character in a lot of ways. And then the story itself, I mean, it's atmospheric. It definitely has Gothic vibes. You've got some twists and turns, you know, who can you trust? Who can you not? It's got kind of all those perfect things that I love. There's a mystery in the past that kind of impacts the mystery of the present of the sanatorium, but also you're kind of slowly getting into Ellen and Isaac's story. And I just really enjoyed it. I thought the writing was great. It was creepy. I wouldn't really, I wouldn't say like fast paced thriller in any way, but it was sort of like that slow burn creep fest. And you, like just sort of that feeling of like, ugh, you know, like, like my shoulders were going up and like, is there something behind me? And like that spine chilling kind of feeling to a lot of the scenes and sort of like what's around that door and what's, you know, what's down that hallway. And I really enjoyed it. I really, really did. So I thought this was a great experience. I'm a huge, you know, sign me up, Sarah Pierce, sign me up. I'm a fan. 
and this is actually now it's going to be the first in a series and it fully it was not designed that way i don't think but it wraps up the story but it obviously leaves you kind of open for more in a lot of ways i very much enjoyed this book it is my second of three swiss alps or isolated alps mysteries that i'm going to read so stay tuned i still have to read shiver and then I will talk about all three of them. So Shiver One by One and Sanatorium. But I totally enjoyed this book and I'm 100% obsessed with what it looks like, which in no way impacted my enjoyment of the book. It's just a cherry on top. And the last book that I finished this month was another one of my five star predictions and it's The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab. And this was another book that for some reason I couldn't bring myself to dog ear a page. So you guys, can you even see? how many it's like an entire stack of post-it notes in here this book is so beautiful so so beautiful and i may have cried more than once reading this book and by may have i mean 100 percent cried more than once reading this book i loved it i totally loved it and again i'm not going to give you all my feelings I will talk some in my five star predictions as well, but this is just such an incredibly well-crafted story from the language to the plot, to the characters, to the incredible attention to detail that went into this. And if you guys are a fan of E. Schwab, you probably already know this story, but this book was basically 10 years in the making. And she had a glimmer of an idea and sat on it and She's so organic in her writing in that if it's not the right book at the right time or she's not in the right place at that time, she won't write the book. And for years she thought about it and she always has this metaphor about how she kind of always has different pots on the stove and different stories of the different pots and the degrees of heat kind of go up and down as she's working on things. And this was always sort of simmering in the background, in the back of the stove. And you can, I think, feel all of her love and all of her emotion that went into writing this book. And I feel like this is probably her most personal book. And I feel like it, it just completely bled into the characters and bled into the pages of how much of a labor of love this book was for her. So this book opens in France in 1714 and Addie is about to get married and she just doesn't want any part of it. And she doesn't wanna be tied down. She doesn't wanna be married to this man. She wants to be free and she wants to live her life and she wants to see things and she wants to be out in the world. And she's prayed and prayed and prayed for this marriage to not happen, but it's the night of her wedding and she literally runs through the woods sort of screaming for help, praying for someone to get her out of this. And she has been warned to never pray to the gods who answer at night. And sure enough, at night, one of the gods answers her. And he grants her kind of her wish to be free. And she has no idea what she has just made a deal for and what it's going to mean to her. So what she very quickly finds out is he has granted her this freedom that she's been longing for. But the hitch is that nobody will remember her ever again. So anyone she meets forgets her as soon as they leave the room. You could, she's sitting at your dining room table and you walk into the kitchen and you come back and you're like, wait, who's this woman sitting at my dining room table? So her family doesn't remember her, her friends don't remember her and no one else that she meets over the course of her life will ever remember her again. So there's so many layers to this deal that she had made that she was never aware of in the first place. And we get to follow her as she figures out how to survive and how to live and sort of what all the terms of this deal are that she made. But at the same time, we get to 2014 and we're in New York City and Addie is living there. She's been doing this thing for 300 years and she's figured out how to survive and how to get by. And she loves to consume anything creative so books and art and music that's really her passion so she goes to this bookstore this little indie bookstore in new york city and you know meets the guy at the front counter henry and leaves and goes about her business and the next day she comes back again and he remembers her and henry is the first person in 300 years 
who remembers her and knows who she is and not like knows her history, but it's like, yep, you were here yesterday. And she was like, wait a minute. So then we get to see Addie try and figure out what it is about Henry that makes him special and makes him remember who she is. And we get to see their relationship. So we go back and forth in time. So we see time jumps over the 300 years and some of it is based in fact and she's meeting real historical figures and some of it is based in complete fiction. And the beauty of it is, and again, something V.E. Schwab talked about, was that she wanted to write it in a way that you're not sure. I mean, obviously, you know, like Beethoven is a real person, but there's other people she mentions and you're like, is that a fact, like factual person or is that a fictional person? And she weaves it together so beautifully that like, you're not quite sure, but it's, it's just so good. It's just so freaking good, you guys. And it is full of amazing lines. It's just, it's just such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful story such a beautiful story. So that's going to do it for March. I'm feeling really good about the books, even though there was definitely a fuzz factor to my month. But let me know what you guys read. If you read any of these, if you had a favorite of the month, how your reading month went. Was I the only one who was fuzzy as can be? But thank you guys so much for hanging out today and spending some of your time with me. And I will see you all in the next video. Bye, everybody.